Political parties tend not to campaign for higher taxes, even though taxation is an essential component of the state, enabling governments to run schools, hospitals and other services. Talking about tax is a surefire vote loser. Philip Hammond at the budget followed this logic. The Chancellor ducked any significant tax increases to fund the £20 billion increase in spending on the NHS by the early 2020s promised by Theresa May this year. He even found room to cut income taxes for millions of people, which is likely to benefit the richest most. The Chancellor said this would help meet another of the Prime Minister's pre-budget promises, to end austerity. Most observers do not believe Hammond has brought an end to the era of tight fiscal constraint imposed by the Tories. Neither did he show that he is a responsible manager of the public finances. For years the Conservatives have massaged the truth to argue they were reducing the budget deficit and lowering the national debt. This latest budget smashed that veneer to smithereens. Hammond was presented with stronger tax receipts and lower public spending for this financial year, worth about £12 billion, and chose to spend every single penny. The Office for Budget Responsibility OBR, said the government was on track for a budget surplus of £3.5 billion by 2023-24. Instead, Hammond's tax and spending plans mean the government will run a deficit of £19.8 billion. Although the national debt will fall as a proportion of GDP, it will rise in cash terms to reach almost £1.9 trillion. The Institute for Fiscal Studies, the most respected tax and spending experts in the country, warned Hammond had taken a gamble with the public finances that might soon backfire. With Brexit on the horizon, there are economic shocks that could result in the budget deficit ballooning even further. Running a budget deficit is not inherently dangerous, at least in the short term and not to excessive levels. The NHS needs vital additional funding, while greater public spending can help to stimulate the economy, in turn generating more income for the exchequer. Most economists, however, believe that taxes will need to rise significantly over the coming decades to pay for the greater levels of public spending required to support our aging population. To maintain the quality of the welfare state, we need to look more like Denmark than the U.S. Higher tax, higher spend. The OBR estimates NHS spending will need to almost double from 8% of GDP in the early 2020s to 13.8% by the mid-2060s due to this demographic shift. Without policy changes, public debt relative to the size of the economy could rise to 283% by 2067 from about 80% today. May's chancellor ignored the need to raise revenue to pay for the health service in the long run. The National Institute of Economic and Social Research has urged a comprehensive rethink for our tax system. We have seen taxes gradually cut over the decades since the 1980s, while our system of revenue generation has increasingly been left behind by the changing nature of our economy. Billions of pounds is taken from cars, as well as petrol and diesel sales, which will vanish as electric vehicles become more popular. Despite the new tech tax on internet giants, huge problems remain about how best to tax the fast-growing digital economy. Council tax has been left unreformed for decades. It has become similar to the hated poll tax and should be replaced by a more progressive levy on property. When Theresa May announced that she would increase spending on the NHS earlier this year, she said taxes would need to rise to pay for the increase. But given her party's thin parliamentary majority and the threat of her Brexit plan being voted down by MPs, her chancellor ducked the issue, ignoring the need to raise revenue to pay for the health service in the long run. For this reason, the agenda for the next election, whenever it comes, should not be about which political party can be best trusted to keep taxes low. It will be about who can be trusted to raise them in the most equitable way. New Apple iPads on display. The firm does not want to issue sales figures for the product in future. 
photograph Timothy A. Clary, AFP, Getty Images Apple hopes less is more Apple dipped below its coveted trillion dollar market capitalization last week, as much because of something it isn't going to do as anything it will. Announcing quarterly earnings, it said it would no longer give a breakdown of unit sales for iPhones, iPads and Mac computers, which it has done for more than 20 years. It also offered lower guidance for the final three months of 2018 than expected, predicting sales between $89 billion and $93 billion. Some analysts thought it would guide towards $100 billion. The news prompted concerns that something bad lies ahead. The suspicion is of a coming slip in hardware sales, especially of the iPhone, which generates more than half of Apple's revenues, which would be masked by bumping up prices, as has already happened. Apple retorted that none of its rivals offer such detail on units, which is true, and that despite static year-on-year -year sales, its user base keeps expanding, as evidenced by its growing services business, which includes Apple Pay, iCloud, the App Store and Apple Music. But analysts treat any reduction in data as troubling. Apple still struggles in emerging markets such as India, where high prices are a handicap, and China has not turned out to be the promised land that chief executive Tim Cook expected. It generates less revenue than the Americas or Europe. While the buffeting of U.S.-China trade wars and a strong dollar don't help, Apple's real challenge is that the global smartphone business is in recession, having shrunk four quarters in a row. Cook's challenge is to manage a transition to an essentially static business. Unless, that is, Sir Joni Ive has something in his design laboratories to put even the iPhone to shame. Self-driving cars? Augmented reality glasses? Thursday's cutback on data makes such futures feel very distant. The average house price in London is more than £460,000. Photograph Martin Godwin for The Guardian Don't hold your breath for a house price crash for the bedraggled army of London's wannabe but hopelessly priced out home buyers. There are some tantalizing signs that the longed-for Great London house price crash may finally materialize. Brexit has helped to cool rents and knocked the stuffing out of the luxury apartments market. Transactions are flat or falling and, to use the language of estate agents, only, realistically priced, properties have any chance of selling. The good news from Seville's, about the most respected house price forecaster, is that London's weakness will continue through 2019, with prices likely to drop a further 2%. Expects house price inflation over the next five years to be greatest in the northwest in Yorkshire and Humberside, with projected rises of about 20%. That will easily outpace the increases of 4.5% expected in London by 2024. Time for Londoners to rejoice? Hardly. The current average house price in the capital is £468,544. A fall next year of 2%, if it materializes, is not a crash. It will knock around £10,000 off the typical home, in nowhere near enough to bring the market back into the realm of affordability for most young adults. Dublin in 2007-11 was a proper crash, prices there dropped by more than 50% from peak to trough. House prices in the capital have historically been double those in the north. The long London boom and swift recovery from the 2008 financial crisis now means that they trade at three times more. Even if we factor in Seville's is forecast 20% gains in the north over the next five years with sluggish growth in the south, the ratio will fall only to 2.5. London still looks very pricey by most measures, but is likely to remain so. The only crumb of comfort for young buyers in the city is that sitting outside the market and patiently building up a deposit next year won't hurt, but such advice wouldn't be right north of the wash. The sad truth for all those hoping for homes in the capital to be affordable again is that there are simply too many frustrated London buyers in reserve, who will step in and buy on signs of weakness, providing a floor for the market. It's worth noting the population data from the Office for National Statistics this week, which said that, that there are now 66 million people in the UK, the highest number ever. 
More importantly, the UK population is projected to continue growing, reaching almost 73 million by 2041. This constantly rising demand, plus low interest rates, rather than just the persistent failure to build enough homes, is the fundamental driver behind rising real house prices.